everyone. I'm super excited to be here today, um, and I thank you all for joining us uh, for a Food Bites uh, webinar. My name is Ann Grevin. For those I don't know, I'm the global head of Food and Ag uh, Startup Innovation at Rabobank and part of this amazing Food Bites team. I'm really excited to be hosting, which is my first webinar as host, so thank you all for joining me on my inaugural uh, session. Believe it or not, this is our seventh webinar uh, in a series that we uh, will run through July. Over the last two months, we've hosted six webinars and we've had 1,200 attendees from more than 35 countries, a really amazing reach for our community. We tend to address topics that are uh, about investing um, and how, how people are doing in the current environment, how consumer behavior is changing, and how models are being pivoted to address the new economy. We continue to evolve our uh, platform to serve our community during this unprecedented time, uh, probably a message you're hearing from many. But for us, it's very, very crucial that we continue to devolve, evolve and connect people in this ever-changing landscape. While we expected quarantine to be brief, it does feel like it's going to be much more uh, longer and more complicated than we had all imagined. This is resulting in a lot of change, and change is also the forefront of innovation. It is because of this change and the need for innovation that we are hearing from our corporate partners that we are trying to make uh, connections, not only through webinars, but through any other of our discussion areas, whether it's our newsletters, our blogs, so please lean in and be part of this community. The Food Bites team, as you know, our mission is to support our community, foster these connections, and build communication channels that may not exist somewhere else. Today we're gonna to be talking about funding startups because funding them is a big part of how we can support and accelerate change. It is no surprise that the COVID crisis has created a lot of disruptions for startups in trying to raise money. And so we thought this was a good time to take a moment and speak to some of our partners um, about how they are addressing, not only looking at financing, but ways that we can lean in and help change and create an open dialogue that may perpetuate the ease of investment for those startups, but also for investors alike. Um, we're going to, today we're going to try to, and I know through all the panelists, they have a lot of deep understanding. We're going to be speaking about um, investment strategies. What are startups doing right now? How are they um, reaching out to investors? Um, how evaluations and what are they looking like? I think, believe it or not, and we heard in our first startup that that's changing rapidly. And what are the expectations? And for startups, we really want to hear how you can, uh, and we hope to present how you can better present yourself and make it more attractive to others to invest. Before I introduce our speakers, I want to uh, take a moment and pause here for uh, one of my colleagues in Europe, Liz Divis, who's going to speak about um, how we are actually reaching out and scouting for startups to be part of this community. I'm going to pass it over to you for a moment, Liz. Thanks, Annie, and thank you all to the companies joining us today for the first time. Um, through Food Buys, we aim to connect promising entrepreneurs with the greater food and egg community that we've built over the past several years. Initiatives like this webinar show how our community can build each other up and share valuable insights during especially ch challenging times. If you'd like to get further involved in our network, we have two programs to offer, uh, which I would like to bring to your attention. Uh, the first program is Food Bites Pitch. This program gives startups access to industry mentors, investors, and corporates, culminating in a final pitch competition. And it, it gives, uh, it introduces corporates um, to groundbreaking innovation and uh, disrupting startups. And then we have the second program, that's the Food Bites Pilot Program. This program pairs a corporate and a startup together over six to nine months to collaborate on a specific goal or industry challenge. So if you're an investor or a corporate and you're interested in a partnership, please reach out to us at foodbytes at rebobank.com. And if you're a startup interested in learning more and being considered for the pilot program, you could fill in the interest form on our website at foodbytesworld.com. Thank you and enjoy the webinar. Thank you, Liz. Um, so without any other uh, delays, I want to uh, really excited to introduce our panelists. We are very fortunate to have a series of partners not only startups, but also investors who've been part of our community for a very long period of time. 
and help to build this amazing uh, network. Tom Spear is the founder and managing partner at Boulder Food Groups. It's a venture capital firm that seeks partnerships with early stage food and beverage companies. He's also been a panelist at uh, our Food Bites Pitch competitions, as well as uh, been a, a scoring partner since our inception. We welcome you, uh, Tom, and we look forward to hearing your comments today. Um, so thank you. Dan Kurzak, he's uh, uh, one of our alumni from Boulder. Um, he is not only an alumni of our Food Bites Pitch competition, but our Food Bites pilot, formerly known as Tara. Um, he's the chief grain officer at uh, Regrained. He has uh, added a very interesting story about a current fundraising, um, but he's really created this upcycled functional ingredient, which uh, can be used in many uh, products in the CPG um, food landscape. I want to next introduce Sean Peters, also an alumni from our Food Bites London, very recently in 2019. Um, he, as well as an entrepreneur, um, really looking at how technology can um, create new ways of growing animal feed um, on dry land. He can speak a little bit about that, but also his journey um, in fundraising in this very uh, tumultuous time. And last but not least, um, a Rabobank partner, friend, colleague, um, and a longtime investor. Um, he is the head of our Rabo Food and Agri Innovation Team, Richard O'Gorman. Um, he also has been a partner and a big supporter in building the food bike community that we have today, not only as a judge, mentor, and uh, uh, partner, um, but he's going to speak about what he's seeing in the investment landscape and, and how um, the advice he can offer startups, but um, and what are the areas that we can go to as we look to raise money. So welcome, uh, Richard. I'm going to do a little rules of engagement before we move on and making it, try to make it very quick. Um, I'm going to have each of our panelists speak a little bit about um, select topics, which will be on the screen. We will have, um, they'll be all talking about different components of the fundraising landscape. Um, for those of you uh, attending who are new to Blue Jeans, um, on the bottom you can scale your uh, the slides and the speaker who are speaking on the very bottom of the screen, um, and it allows you to adjust it for your own viewing. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to pass it to uh, Richard first, um, and then Tom to speak about you know what are the new investment strategies rising in the market um, and from your perspective, and we'll go from there. Good to be here. A pleasure to, to, to be with you all. In terms of the, 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 the strategies that we see in general from uh, or the more successful strategies that we see at the moment from startups is really the clarity of vision. We're seeing a lot of uh, proposals through at this time and I think that there's a very distinct difference between those with a very, a very clear value proposition today and how it's going to manifest through the, the, the corona crisis and not the other side versus those not focused on that. I think it's very, very difficult to, uh, as, as an investor, to, 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 to take on the additional cash burn that is around, that is, that is clear, or that is likely through the, the corona crisis without clear visibility on the, on, the, on the value proposition and how that's going to work through as the company develops. I think that's a very clear, uh, that's, a, that's a very clear point to, to, to focus on from a, from a startup uh, p uh, pitching perspective. I think what we're seeing more uh, also is, is the, the distinct split between startups and, and scale-ups that have already had early and very fruitful discussions with investors versus those that are starting from scratch now. And those that have, that have started processes earlier and in very much more detailed discussions are very much at a better, in a better situation than those who are starting from scratch now. But uh, they're, they're just two immediate thoughts. I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. I look forward to picking up in uh, the next topic. I uh, I do agree with Richard. It's a very specific story here, and you know I think that if you have the right, even if you're in the in in business already, COVID's happened and it's really changed your model. As long as you have a clear and decisive plan on how to pivot, I think that that could potentially give investors comfort and give folks a reason to want to get involved. Um, you know I don't if someone showed us a restaurant opportunity. Today, I mean, you know, a hundred people would probably say, "Why would I ever do a restaurant investment investment today?" But if the opportunity was geared toward 
COVID with their technology, their way they're approaching consumers, you know, you could see a path forward, right? I mean, obviously ghost kitchens are, are real and depending on the positioning, just about anything's fair game. But I do think uh, entrepreneurs need to realize as well that, you know, depending on their category and what the opportunity is, they may have to adjust their expectations. If they're on an on fire category and something that's really working, maybe, it, you know, there is no change to evaluation expectations. If you're in an area that's really been impacted, I think that, you know, I, how can you not take that into consideration? Thank you both. Um, I want to give the floor now to uh, to Sean and then Dan, really to speak about sort of the challenges they're seeing and maybe a little bit about what they've been up to um, and how it's uh, how it's impacted their day to day, not only running of their business, but also, um, you know, how they are thinking about their own funding and their next steps. So maybe uh, you first, Sean, and then um, we'll take it to, to Dan, if that's OK. Yeah, thank you uh, so much to Ravel Banks and to the, to the team for, for hosting this event. Really honored to be on this panel, especially with, um, with some of the other folks here. Um, we have been really fortunate. We just closed out an investment round right before things started to get um, busy with COVID. Um, so we're doing uh, agriculture technology uh, focused on using Lemna or as a replacement for um, soybean nitrogen for animal feed. Um, so a few things that I, I think we're seeing in the market um, and I think I, I'd offer as advice uh, to entrepreneurs. Um, the first is that, I mean, building off of Tom's point, there are going to be some business models that don't make sense within this marketplace. But I think especially for culture or food focused entrepreneurs, um, are the, the trend lines that, you know, keep the market that we're serving going up when you look at a, say, five year spread? And that's only that even with the economic downturn, and that's driven, you know, a lot by population growth. Um, and so I think if you frame your pitch, taking COVID into account, um, you can play to the strengths that we have within our industry um, towards investors. I mean, this will end, you know, the, the economy will bounce back, whether it's a year or five years, you know, is yet to be seen. But I think that making sure that you tailor, your, tailor the conversation you're having with investors um, and framing it to what's happening within COVID right now um, is, is critically important. I think it's also, you know, very important not to shy away from that. Um, I, I think it would be a critical error to go into a pitch and not mention uh, coronavirus or the, uh, the, the global pandemic. Um, I would address it head on. Um, and taking a look at your model and seeing if there aren't ways you can pivot your model to better serve markets. I think Tom's example of ghost restaurants is a great one. Um, and of course, you know, that shifts based on the, the markets we're all operating in. But um, I'm, I've seen some really creative ways uh, to, uh, to find other secondary markets temporarily or um, full pivots in the meanwhile. Um, so lots of other things to talk about here. I'm really excited to get into it over the meat of this conversation, but I'll pause there um, for this, uh, this intro. Hey everybody, Dan here from, from Regrain. Great, great to be with you. Love Robo. Uh, it's been an important part of Regrain's journey this, this whole time uh, from you know, like 2016 onward. And as it relates to today, I mean, there's a lot of a lot of things that, that I'm excited to go through today. Uh, first, I just want to acknowledge that this is my first time as a CEO going through, you know, a a downturn like this. I know it's true for many of us. And <laughs> just want to note that, like, while I, I'm thrilled to be up here participating in this panel, frankly, I'm looking I'm looking for advice, too. You know, I think it's OK to not. Um, not be 100% confident uh, right now and to, to have concerns and to want to like lean on the community and others to to help you know get through this because other other folks have, have been through maybe not this exact situation before but others in a, in a changing world for us with regrand in our core business model is is very very simple we turn trash into into money and right now we're in a time of, of increased you know resource constraints and I think if anything what one of the things that we're really doing is uh, tightening our messaging around like, why this really makes sense. And our business model has a few main pieces to it. One of them is much uh, big vision of scale, which is large CPG companies selling them ingredients. You know, we're still actively doing that. But as soon as this hit, um, a lot of these these projects kind of got had to had to you know slow down or you know we reassess based on based on current realities and. 
we've been able to focus more on what can the fundamentals of what can generate revenue today and how can we cut you know how can we cut costs today and we have a consumer facing brand we have direct to consumer channels we weren't overly indexed in retail and, and things like that so we've really taken a look internally at how we can focus on the fundamentals and increase increase sales decrease cost focus less budget on you know on r d you know longer term r d projects right now and on on the essentials and you know we were able to close a little bit of a, a bridge round in the beginning of this and one of the things that i'll, I'll probably be speaking about more that's a bit non-traditional is uh, we've had some experience with equity crowdfunding and we weren't planning on doing another equity crowdfunding round um but with everything going on, that is that has become a part of our, our fundraising strategy as a part of the capital stack for what we, we think we need to uh, to really thrive in the, in the next few years. And so I can bring some of that 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 perspective as well. So thanks again. And um, Dan, I think you've you you brought up a really good point that, you know, we are in a time where I think not just startups, everyone needs advice and how you manage through um, what is something that none of us have experienced in before. And. And hopefully, um, when we get through it, never have to experience again. So uh, I think uh, on all sides, um, getting advice is, is maybe how we all get smarter, stronger, and more resilient. Um, so with that, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna ask that I uh, pass it off to uh, Nina, who has some uh, prepared questions, um, but also uh, there we we want to start answering questions from the community. So I. Without further ado, let me introduce Nina Myers, for those of you who don't know her, another member of our Food Bites family, um, who really does uh, uh, bring the community together from the startups and the investors. And so take it away, Nina. Perfect. Thanks, Anne. Hopefully I can be a, a ball of energy at this time. We're working across three time zones right now. So for Dan, it's the crack of dawn in San Francisco, a bit later afternoon for the Europeans. Um, and depending on who you are, sort of morning time in New York. Um, but thanks, thanks, Anne, for handing it over. And I'm, I'm excited. Uh, this is a little bit of a different format than we've done. It's great to get the panelists to kind of keep it snippy in the beginning and then move into a bit of, of the meat of the conversation. Um, so we have nearly 150 people on the line. Again, a reminder to please submit your questions. We have a lot of, of pre-questions that we're happy to go through. Um, but we know that this is a very fluid and changing situation. and especially for startups, you have two investors on the line who are actively looking at deals constantly. They're dealing with their engaged portfolio companies. Um, so this is your time to ask them kind of everything you want to know. But um, I'd like to kick it off because Dan mentioned this a little bit and, and we have are seeing this more and more around this sort of um, this, ult, you know, alternative bridge financing question. So there's a lot of companies thinking about equity crowdfunding in a, you know, pre-COVID climate uh, I think we didn't have so many companies coming to us saying that they were exploring this as an option. So maybe, um, Dan, let's kick it back to you since you just touched on it a little bit, but tell us about your experience with that platform so far and why um, you've decided it's a, a, a good choice uh, for Regrained as, as you are in survival mode through COVID. And then maybe um, Tom and Richard, if you have any differing thoughts from your specific perspectives on when this type of, of equity crowdfunding makes sense and or if there's other um, bridging opportunities that you feel um, are working really well for startups that you know. So, and Sean, I know you have experience with this too, so this is really a question for everyone. Jump in where, where you, where you uh, think that makes sense, but I'll hand it over to you, Dan, first. Great, great, and so equity crowdfunding is really interesting uh, model you know we we actually first did it in 2018 right after the uh it's called regulation cf here in the u.s passed which allowed non-accredited investors to in, purchase you know equity in your business or convertible note um minimum investments of 100 bucks to 100 thousand um you could raise just about just over a million and we first did this right after it passed pretty successfully back then we we did it because it was on mission for us you know we're um, very focused on on mission, and it's the democratization of capital, right? It's the ability for your customers, for your community, to to invest. Whereas when you're working with angel investors or things like that, it's it's not practical to. I mean, it's difficult. It's, you spend more time getting a ten thousand dollar check from someone who's actually an angel investor than you would from someone uh, that that can write in a hundred thousand dollar check, right? And so, the idea of an a hundred dollar check is a whole other order of magnitude. Um, but what happens is you put you put in a lot of work up front 
and you really engage the community, you can actually raise quite a bit of money. We raised about $700,000 the first time around doing this, and we learned a lot through it. Um, that you know, we were, we we're proud of it, and probably wouldn't have wouldn't have done it again. Um, although a few things are happening, you know, the big one, the big trigger is is, is COVID, of course. Um, and in addressing it, there's some changes uh, happening in the SEC, you know, around equity crowdfunding too, that have lowered the barriers to launching these campaigns, and that potentially in June could actually increase the amount that you're able to raise. That may might make it make more sense for you know for more uh, businesses. Now, what we like about this is that what we can do is, and we're maybe uniquely set up to do this because we already have about 700 investors that participated in the first equity crowdfunding round. We were not going to be able to go back to those people to reinvest in our business just because it's, many of them are non-accredited investors. It's not, not super practical uh, to, to go about that. But now, if we set, set up a second one, we can actually go back just like you would to an institutional investor and say, hey, work with us on this, like help us get through this. You know, this, this is what we've been able to do. You know, this is what we're gonna be able to do, reinvest. And we actually expect to fill most of the round with those existing investors that would have otherwise not had the opportunity to, to double down on their investment and help us, you know, help us get through this. And I just, I really believe that there, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of you know, caveats to doing something like this directly, especially from a governance perspective. Um, and it doesn't make sense for for all businesses for sure, but I think especially in this in this environment where there's really this uh, increased sense of, of urgency, hopefully around rallying together, you know, as a as a planet around common causes, and in our case, like resource, you know, about the way we value resources is really core to that. Bring out being able to bring more people into that to own that, you know, with you, um, you know, is is something that I think can be. Be really compelling and i'm gonna say it now for like the fourth time there's a lot of caveats in how to set this up correctly because it can be very complicated but it can be done um strategically and 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 smoothly and that's you know something that, that we ultimately decided was going to be one of the ways that we could adapt and be resilient uh to this Great. um even though it wasn't part of the plan before great thank you dan and and uh tom or or uh richard any any thoughts from the investor side and how you're thinking about something like equity crowdfunding as a bridge funding opportunity right now? Sure, I'll go first and then pass it to Richard. You know, for our portfolio companies, I suppose it's something that could be considered. Uh, you know, it really depends on what you're going for. I think that you have to be realistic. There's a couple examples in the crowdfunding world where the amount of money raised has been super impressive, and that's amazing. I mean, I think that any company that can do that effectively whether for equity or for just for product or for future product, I think is really, you know, terrific mechanism for, for companies to, to help out. So I would, you know, I would definitely use it as a lever. I, I do think that if you're, you know, in some ways, if you really have a, a plan and trying to go after institutional capital that you think can help to accelerate your curve, I think that that capital may in some ways be a bit more valuable. You know, we consider ourselves value-added investors because of our deep knowledge in consumer packaged goods. And, um, you know, I think that, but look, if, you know, if, if us or another institution is not willing to do it and you can raise a million dollars from the crowd, it, I think that's super, you know, for a company, that's fabulous. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, I, I would just add to that. I mean, from our perspective, we... Uh, have invested in companies where, where in one in particular, where, where crowdfunding uh, capital was there previously. The governance was uh, was uh, okay from our perspective. Therefore, it was it was not a problem. There have been uh, times when it has uh, raised some issues from a from a institutional capital coming in perspective. Um, but from a company perspective today, I think it's a very interesting um, way of, in some cases, raising fast capital and at attractive valuations for the for the founders and CEOs, founders and, and initial shareholders. So, so, so there is an attraction there for sure. I would just caveat it with, the if the governance is right, then that's okay to bring future and fine for future institutional uh, capital. But I would just be a little bit sensitive as to what it ultimately looks like in your cap table and what it will look like when you need to re raise a slightly bigger round with institutionals afterwards. 
but principally no no issues whatsoever. And I take my hat off to you, Dan, for, for getting it over the line so quickly. Great, thank thank you. Um, I, I I cut out for a little bit, Sean. I may move on to another question just to to keep things to keep things going. We we actually have a question on the line, which is something we've been talking about a lot at Food Bites, a lot throughout our platform. Um, and I think this has been kind of the the investor sentiment since the beginning, which is you know a lot of particularly folks in the VC world, which you guys can speak to, turning inward, um, facing uncertainty in the markets, looking at their portfolio companies. Um, but I think both Tom and Richard, um, you've been able to um, close deals with early stage companies um, during the, throughout the course of this pandemic. Um, I know Tom, your your deal is is more public, and Richard, um, yours hasn't quite been announced yet who the company is. But it, maybe you can speak a little bit sort of tangibly to how your strategy changed um, in working with those companies. Why you think you know it was a success to get those deals deals closed during this time period i think you know the the major question on the startup side is how do we be how do we become one of those companies that's able to get traction and able to get you know investors to to put money behind us during this current climate if we're not already in the portfolio so maybe some tangible examples from you on on closing those deals and and really how strategy shifted and why you think they were successful would be helpful for the audience of mostly startups here today um, I, I think, well, for, from our perspective, yeah, we, we've done uh, two deals so far this year, one slightly before COVID completely kicked off, one after. And, and the reality is deals that we're closing around now, which will be announced uh, next week, uh, this one in particular, ha has been in process for quite, you know, for, for, for quite some time and pre-COVID. And so then the discussion is around, does the investment thesis still hold up given this current the current challenges that we've got today with with COVID, and in this case, it very much does. In fact, it, it reinforces it to, to to on many levels. Uh, so so that's the, the the context for our investment. So so I mean, I think it's it would be um, unfair to say that as um, a portfolio manager that with such a shock in the system that the initial uh, focus is on protecting portfolio, ensuring the portfolio companies individually and collectively are. Uh, robust enough to weather this this storm, and I and I think that was definitely the case for the first let's say six to eight weeks. Well, certainly six weeks, let's say from from the the initial shock of of COVID. But I think it's fair to say, and it's it's certainly the case from with discussions I'm having with other uh, participants in the market that there very much is a more outwardly looking focus now, but it is very much on a on an opportunity basis, and so. Getting the, the, the value proposition crystal clear through the system is absolutely central to any any such pitch and getting any such attention from investors at this point. Just say really quickly a few things. Um, you know, obviously, to the extent founders and management teams already have existing relationships that are are warm um, prior to COVID, and there's been face-to-face -face interactions, and you know, whether at conferences or wherever. Um, you know, those are certainly uh, relationships that should continue. And I don't know that you need to be asking for Zoom calls with, you know, investors on a weekly basis. Um, but I think, you know, providing written updates, you know, maybe on a quarterly basis, requesting a connection with a Zoom call to provide an update and, and making sure that they, you know, get to know you. It's pretty, I think you can get to know people quite nicely on on, on Zoom or Blue, Blue Jeans. My apologies to Blue Jeans for plug plugging. Uh, the other firm, but, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I think there's, you know, that's a great way to go. And that's how we're thinking about it. Um, you know, we would consider a new investment in someone we've never met before. Um, it's going to take more time. And I think it's going to take a lot of effort on both sides to make it happen. Great. Thank, thank you, Tom. I, Sean and Dan, I, I think want to hand it over to you a little bit because we only touched sort of the, the tip of the iceberg in the initial intro. But um, Sean, maybe start with you around so, some practical tips around um, you know, how you have uh, kind of decreased burn and what you've done in, in, in dry grows landscape in order to be able to close this deal, what the challenges you faced were um, with the Series A um, and getting that locked in during during COVID. I think you're you're one of the, the lucky few um, and that's a result of, of hard work and, and a lot of challenges. Um, but you were able to make make it happen and close close this deal. So maybe again, sort of from your entrepreneurial perspective, sharing some of those you know best practices that you put in place very quickly um, in order to close this deal during the during the pandemic. So the, there's definitely challenges, and some of them have been 
spoken about already. Um, anybody who is raising now and thought they would have a long window to raise and is running out of cash, you may not hit as many milestones as you would have expected. So there may be challenges on that side. Um, if you're starting out a raise right now, I think a lot of the fundamentals um, that I would you know, give as advice to entrepreneurs starting out still apply here. I mean, when we closed our round, we had talked to something like 100 investors over the course of a year. Um, many of them were later stage. We filed those and documented them and keep those relationships alive so that they know about any successes that we've had. So when we're doing our next round, if they're larger ticket sizes, we can come back to them and say, look, we've done this, you know, we've done this great work. Last time we talked to you, we were too small. Now we've achieved all of this stuff. We're ready for the next chunk of financing. Let's have a conversation. And then, you know, to Tom's point, you're not coming in completely fresh. You're coming in with a, you know, a pseudo relationship that you can build upon and with some, you know, points in your history that are, you know, all positive. Um, so I, th I think keeping that process to raises even during these kind of times is, is really critical. Um, like I said before, I think tackling COVID head on in a pitch is really important. Um, it's going to be on every investor's mind. And so if you have a really good response that you're dealing with it, um, that can really help your case. Um, and I'll, I'd also say, um, you know, there are challenges with moving to uh, blue jeans only uh, contact with your teams. Um, you know, not being able to, if you're doing anything technical, necessarily be in labs and these kinds of things. So finding good contingency plans around all of those and incorporating these kind of delays into your Gantt charts, I think would be really critical. Um, and then building upon that, I would say, uh, finally, um, think about what kind of investors you want to attract for the ticket you're raising. Um, many VCs will be clamping down a bit, you know, protecting the ventures that they currently have and investing a little bit less. Many family offices, you know, may not have the same kind of strategy. And um, to the crowdfunding point earlier, many investors who, you know, would be mid-range angels, maybe now are only going to do 100, 1,000 uh, pound or dollar ticket sizes, which would be appropriate for a crowdfunding campaign. So the, it might be uh, important to think about who you're targeting in your investment um, strategy rather than just, you know, doing the traditional hit the VC run and, and hope for the best. Those are all really great points, Sean. And, you know, some other... One thing that, that we were thinking of as soon as this, as soon as this hit, is we realized before all this, in a lot of ways, kind of had this uh, "the world is our oyster" type type mentality, where we had the luxury of being able to focus on um, some long term thinking. You know, heavy R and D has been Regrain's focus for the last few years, both on the you know we've got some machinery that we ended up like patenting, and you know all this work with how we can use our ingredient, and how it can be used, should it, how it should be used. Um, you know, some projects that were going to take several years to see to see revenue that all of a sudden now you know the, the mentality had to shift from um to to survival mode and then if we're lucky we'll get to get through uh like a recovery mode and then we'll get back into growth mode and that could take um i guess theoretically it could take months it'll probably take at least at least a year if not you know if not years for things to return to, um, I guess, how uh, how were we able to think about them in a, in, a, in a sense before? And so, you know, specifically to the questions about about burn and things like that, what we you know really did is 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 is, is clamp down internally and and take a look at how you know let's let's assume we ra were able to not able to raise any more money, you know how how what you know what's really core and you know how can we get whereas revenue hadn't really been the focus. Up, you know, up until until all this, all of a sudden, let's 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 really focus on where we know we can we can drive drive revenue. And we had a, a new product that we were launching that, that has really been you know the focus on that. And um, we still maintain you know the same big picture you know vision. And it's important, I think, for all founders to you know have a really you know well defined vision of what you're you know what you're trying to do in the world and how how your business is gonna accomplish its, you know, its mission and, and, and achieve profitability, you know, in, in doing that, but needing, I guess, needing to, to reframe and take more of a near-term look in, inside the business um, and just operate, you know, and, and uh, get get through this. And so, and we're still in the middle of it, you know, but that's uh, hopefully some other um, kind of color to, you know, what it, what, it, what it looks like on the, you know, on the ground um, from, you know, being inside the business. Great. Thank, thank you, Dan. And, and thanks, Sean, as well. I want to, we have a couple of questions that are 
touching on a few of the same things and we had some pre pre bulleted thoughts we wanted to touch on. So I'll try to loop it all together. Um, I think one thing that we'd love to hear from the investors on, and, and I think I'll start with you, Tom, um, but it is this idea of now that we're in this completely digital world and we, we don't know how long we're going to be here for, it felt like it would be much shorter um, at the beginning of this crisis and now we're sort of getting used to it. Um, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on this idea of, of pitching virtually and kind of what entrepreneurs need to be thinking about in this new arena that we're in in order to have the most success in that. Um, I think we had, we had some questions too, so I'll make this even broader, um, potentially for Richard to weigh in um, or the entrepreneurs as well. But, you know, it, it, it touches on this, which is this idea that, you know, investors historically have been looking for, you know, companies that have a wow factor, good margins, they have a path to profitability. Um, but, you know, is, is that going to, is that going to change now? Like how, uh, you know, how can businesses who have great margins and model um, and, you know, and profitability potential as well that maybe aren't as, as sexy uh, as businesses were getting, that were getting funded pre-COVID, is there more of an opportunity for those types of businesses now? And maybe how does that kind of idea relate to this pitching your concept virtually and getting your passion and enthusiasm and all of those um, sort of facets to shine through. So maybe, uh, Tom, I'll pass it to you to speak to that a little bit, um, and Richard, you can weigh in too. And then we're starting to get more comments, lots more comments through the Q&A, so I'll, I'll speed things up after that, but love to hear from you all on some tangible ideas there. Over to you, Tom. Yeah, if, if, if you know you have a profitable business model, you know to the extent you're actually running the business profitably already, and I think that's fabulous, and I think that's really exciting. Uh, so I don't know. I, I would think that would be interesting to investors. You know, certainly growth is really important um, when you're thinking about market share and becoming a leader in whatever market you're going after. Uh, so if you're profitable but growing at one percent a year for a decade, you know, I think that might cause some challenges. Um, but no, I think that's really attractive. We are asking our portfolio companies to really double down their efforts because margin and profitability are, are more important than ever before. And all the you know, private equity investors that are larger than us and strategics um, are all really honed in on that. So, yeah, we're, we're thoughtful about it. And, Tom, maybe some, some thoughts on the virtual pitching considerations that companies should be making now. Sure. Yeah, have a really tight story. Uh, be very, very uh, decisive about where you're going, as, as Richard said at the outset. Uh, you know, to take on historical financials head on. Um, I mean, to the extent you already have operating history, um, you know, that's, investors are going to want to get right to that. So, you know, don't waste people's time. We're all, you know, busy. We're all trying to make decisions and you know, come with as much information that you can and put your best foot forward with, you know, as much information as you're, you're comfortable sharing, whether, you know, outside of an NDA or within an NDA. I'd second that completely, Tom. I mean, I, I think ultimately the, the, the fundamentals don't change. When we, when we we're looking for um, portfolio investments, we're still looking for does the technology, does the offering solve a meaningful problem? Do the founders and stakeholders share the values that we share? Can we see and do we have visibility on the development of the unit economics and the actual value of the proposition to the to to the to the market and to the system? You know, you you, you talk, Nina, you know, about about opportunities that already have profitability, um, and yes, the shock today may mean that the business model may need to be changed. But if the, if, if if the fundamentals of the of of, the, of that triangle are still there, it's very much something that we will look and look very carefully at and. Do our best to look through the the, the, the COVID um, challenge that we've that, that we've got in relation though to virtual presenting and not media. I mean that 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 is that is somewhat of a departure. Uh, we haven't done it uh, yet entirely entirely by 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 um, blue jeans in this case, but we we I don't rule it out, and I, I think it's very quickly being normalised as a, as our means of communi communication. So. We may well have this discussion in three or four months' time, and actually, we will wonder why we even discussed whether we would uh, do this without meeting in person. This is becoming very much part of our, our how we operate. So I think it's coming. I, I wouldn't be afraid of it as an entrepreneur. But back to Tom's point, the story has to be tight. The impression has to be good up front, and and, and the, the 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 understanding of what COVID means for all of this needs to be fir very firmly embedded in the 
in the story. Great, thank you. I, I, I'm getting a, a reminder from some folks on the Food Bites team too, though, that you know, from our perspective at, at Food Bites and working and coaching startups on pitching, you know, it, it should be as tight and, and tailored and practiced and rehearsed as it would be on a on a pitching stage because it's you you need to be that much more articulate um, in when you when you're not you know you sort of don't have physical people in the room and body language to read and passion to pick up on so. Um, I, I just got that through a little chat back channel, so to add the Food Bites perspective in there too. Um, I think one more thing, because we actually have gotten a specific question on it um, that just came in, but is if if um, if Tom or or uh, Richard, you can give any examples of sort of the best COVID um, uh, tailored pitches that have come across your decks? Because I know Sean spoke to that a little bit around really being honest about the situation and tailoring your messaging. Um, as you're going out to fundraise regarding this this crisis, sort of leaning into it, but has anything really jumped off your desk um, as uh, as it relates to you know pitching with COVID in mind? Do you have any examples you could share? Obviously not company names, but uh, Richard or Tom, any anything to add on that before we switch over? Yeah, I, I, I do have a couple examples. I think it is very you know opportunity specific right and in the case of one example it was a company going after going after the immunity space they're already in the market uh they were doing well before they've got you know great people around the business and as a result of covid the sales are really going through the roof and that's i mean it's it's uh it kind of it's you know it's a great story for the company and um so that's one example you know i have recently spoken to someone who's working in this ghost kitchen space. And I mean, I think it's undeniable that there's, you know, something there. I mean, so th these ideas, I mean, I think in, the, in these cases, you know, the, the story kind of is in, right in front of them because of everything happening. So they're kind of obvious, but, you know, certain companies are going to have to work harder to really tell that story. Uh, but those are two examples of two pitches that are quite compelling. I mean, very quickly, we, we, we've seen, I mean, it, it's pretty clear certain sectors are seeing an absolute boom in revenue. And so their, their story through holds true. We, we've got like some some local for local opportunities. We've seen some sustainable production opportunities. But it's also actually true that in, in many cases, in some cases, pre-commercial, um, the, the COVID crisis can actually be spun in a very positive direction. If it's R&D focused at that time, I see when there aren't. Uh, travel restrictions and HR issues, it, it, we have seen actually it become a very fruitful time because there's less noise from the, the, the commercial side of the business because they're uh, otherwise engaged at the moment. So, so it, 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 there are different ways to, 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 to spin the story and the impact of COVID. And I think it's a highly, yeah, it's one that needs a, quite a bit of focus, I think. Great. I want to I want to switch gears a little bit. Um, I think there's been a, a lot of coverage around um, this topic and a little bit more sort of um, CPG focused, but I think really all of you could weigh on on it from your distinct points in the in the value chain. Um, but it, it's a question that just came in um, around 70% of sales during this pandemic buying being owned by 19 companies. Um, so really getting your perspectives. You know, there's there's a lot that at least we at Food Bites have been reading on this, and there's sort of the more you know nihilistic a, a approaches to what this means for natural and CPG category. But I guess particularly Tom and Dan, we can start with you, um, and then Sean, you may have some thoughts to um, on a much further upstream perspective. Um, but where do you see like specialty natural CPG? Where do you, where do you see this heading, this category heading, um, in terms of grocery versus online sales, how can natural, you know, yeah, will we see this shift really happening long term? Um, or do we think that sort of this better for you, clean, healthy, um, you know, movement that's been brewing for a very long time um, will will continue to gain momentum outside of COVID? I guess getting your perspectives on sort of this short term shift that we've seen so far um, would be fantastic. So I'll, I'll start with you, Tom. Um, and then, yeah, hand it over to, you know, potentially Sean uh, to weigh in, Dan to weigh in as well. So first of all, it is correct that a lot of the volume did go to the biggest companies. They have the biggest supply chains and supply pipes. So they were able to push the most volume through the system as a result of what happened, 100%. Uh, so it, it, depending on the category you're in, one of two things happened. Either 
your category got a lot bigger or your category got smaller. And if it got smaller, then the story as well, our category is going to, you know, con continue to grow and going to improve as everything improves. And that's true, I think. So I think you can kind of build a baseline of story from a foundation of, of you know, a smaller category that's going to start to grow and things improve. And then on the flip side, if you're now in a much bigger category, like frozen pizza grew from 5 billion to over 7 billion in a matter of two months. I mean, that's a huge shock to the system. And now you're in a category that's, you know, 40, 50% bigger than it was already a huge category competing for market share. And I'm thrilled to be competing in that category, knowing that there's more dollars out there to go after. So I think it really, you know, uh, you know, there's always going to be a competition for market share, uh, you know, really being able to be incredibly focused on your execution and strategy as a small company on your on the Internet side is everything right now. So owning that customer relationship is really important and delivering true value there. Um, I'll pass it to Dan. Yeah. So what I want to thanks, Tom. What I want to touch on there, I think, is the, the consumer behavior you know, side of it. And. Well, for the last I don't know decade or something like that, if you look at how many folks are buying groceries online, you know it's been relatively stable <laughs> you know, up until this point. I think it was like something like 10% of, of people or, or less, somewhere somewhere around there. And you know, as of I saw a stat, I think it was last week that now, and this is going to be no surprise to anyone, it's like over half of people have ordered food online, um, you know, groceries online uh, for the first time, you know, during all this and. What it's done on the CP on the CPG side of the of the business is it radically changes how um, you drive discovery and trial with with customers, right? I mean, uh, food brands that, that sell through retail, you know, we're saying a few things. One is you've got new products that you're launching, even if they're confirmed for resets. Um, all those resets have been delayed because a lot of the stores are just focusing on the fundamentals, you know, and, and keeping up. And even when they do come back, um, or even to promote your existing products, you know, one of the main ways that you get people when you're a small brand um, competing against those those big folks, uh, those big 19 companies, um, you know, you do you do in-store product demonstrations, right, where people taste your product. No, no one wants to do that, you know, right right now. I mean, that's completely uh, you know, not not an option. Um, and who knows how that will return? Uh, the in-store promotions is another way that you drive, you know, discovery of your products, and that's also not relevant right now. I mean, Whole Foods even canceled their an entire promotional period uh, during the pandemic because they didn't need to get new people in the store. They're already selling through, you know, what what they have. And so, what that does though is it creates an opportunity for these direct-to-consumer channels, and you've got your own channels, right? So, um, you know, your own, like for in our case, like you know, Regrain.com or website, and Amazon, but then also other direct-to-consumer channels. Um, I think Imperfect Foods is another uh, Rabobank alumni is a great, you know, great example of, of, that, of that type of company where if you, have a, you know, were uh, able to have those relationships before going into this or even if you can you know, set them up after, that's an, a whole new exploding path to path to market. And, you know, we've seen a huge jump in sales and it's not from retail. It's from these alternative channels that before we're maybe more on the fringes of, of a revenue strategy and now um, at least for the foreseeable future can be can be really core uh, to how, you know, how 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 revenue can grow from a you know customer discovery perspective and the one last piece that I want to touch on there is you know a comment about natural products and you know, things things like that and back in uh, I think one of the big unknowns here is is of course, the, the economic impacts in long term, and if that's going to, you know, push more people towards being, you know, back back to more like price conscious, right? And I think I'm sure the other panelists have, have some views on, you know, on, on that, especially um, you know, Tom. I'm sure has, has seen a lot of the stuff on that. You know, one one thing that's encouraging for me is, you know, if you look back to the last financial the financial downturn in, you know, 2008, um, there was a, a an increased focus on uh, sustainable, you know, environmental, you know, values driven products, you know, coming coming out of that. And kind of to be seen, you know, what will happen, you know, here from there. I think there's going to be some products that are probably, you know, not not going to be core. But you know, we might. There's going to be the whole new kind of societal like value set is being is being defined, you know, right now. And I think there's uh, a lot of I still see a lot of opportunity there to um, help people kind of re, you know, reprioritize, but with that intersection of, of both value and values. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave, that, leave that there. And do we think, uh, do, 
panelists, do you think generally, I mean, happy to get people to jump in quickly. I know we have about eight more minutes and there are a few more bigger concepts I want to get to. I want to make sure to hear from Sean as well. Um, but I mean, the reality at the end of the day, at least in, in North America, is that we're seeing, you know, greater rates of unemployment than, than the Great Depression. And so do we think high level this concept of sustainability um, of, you know, triple bottom line, people profit planet, like, do, do we think that in the face of this recession from a consumer habit standpoint, um, that we're going to continue on the trajectory that we were on? Does anyone else have, I mean, Dan, you've, you've touched on that a little bit, but does anyone else have thoughts? Sean, you're raising your yeah, hand. Yeah, I, I want to jump in here. Um, so I'm going to try to tackle the last question, this question at once. My, my first job <laughs> out of university was with Procter & Gamble. Um, so I'm kicking myself. I don't have access to their data sets anymore. Um, cause it's gotta be so interesting how these markets are shifting. I, I see a few mega trends happening all at once that we don't fully understand yet that are going to be really exciting and shake up markets in a way that I, I don't think are fully, fully understood yet. The first is, um, massive income stratification. So there are going to be, I, we're all, I mean, we're all working right now. We're able to work from home. Um, many people are not. Many people have lost their jobs. The U.S. has had the biggest unemployment dip and there's, you know, pretty good data saying that's underrepresented. That's not going to recover quickly. Um, we're going to be fine. Many people won't. And that's a huge tragedy. So I think what's going to happen is um, there are going to be specialized niche markets and those will grow because the people who are doing okay are going to continue to do okay. The people who aren't doing okay are going to be hyper online. They're going to be hyper targetable and there aren't going to be very many people paying attention to those consumers. So I think this is a massive market gap that could be met better um, targeting lower income consumers who are looking for budget products in order to survive probably the most difficult financial period of their lives. And those people are now buying things online, you know? And so that is, I think, an interesting market gap that, but that will probably be targeted more closely in the years ahead or year ahead. Um, to Dan's point, people are less dependent on grocery distribution. And so there's getting products out to people is a challenge, but I think adjacencies, um, really creative adjacencies, partnerships with other products, uh, Deliveroo or HelloFresh or things like that as free trials could be potential um, options. Um, on, in terms of um, uh, in terms of triple bottom line and more sustainable products, I, I think that providing those products as a niche was never a good way to get widespread proliferation of sustainable trends. You're not going to shift an entire market if you're serving two percent of that market. So I think this just increases the challenge to make sustainable products that are on the same price point and can drive wider spread um, distribution. Um, so I think that like, I, I think that that just means there's a greater challenge to make for uh, non-niche sustainable products. Just one last comment on that. I think, and what we see also in speaking to several strategic and some of the bigger players in the space, that, that this debate between value and values is an ongoing one and which will actually turn out uh, the winner is is unclear. And so there isn't an exact position on both. But from our perspective, we very much see the sustainability thread running through uh, our investment thesis and continuing to do so. I think for, certainly I agree with what Sean said, but, but that debate between value and values I, will be an ongoing one and it is to play out. But certainly there's room for, on the sustainability side, certainly all the way back to, to food production and, 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 uh, and through the value chains. Um, one question that I would like to get to really quickly, it's actually two, so I'll move as quickly as I can, but, um, and it, it's a frank one, and it's probably it's somewhat of a challenging slash uncomfortable one for this panel, but um, we had a great question in the Q&A regarding founding, uh, funding female founders. Um, there was a report done by Karen Karp that uh, only 7% of VC funding has gone to women previously. I'm aware of who's on this panel here today, um, so won't spend time on that, but um, you know, we've talked, we've also had a lot of conversations around just generally needing more diversity to create a more resilient food system um, through the Food Bites platform as well. What are your thoughts on how um, how that might shift uh, as a result of COVID uh, from, from your funding perspective, Tom and or Richard? Yeah, no, I'm very proud that we've, you know, funded many you know, female-led businesses. I think approximately half of our companies have been founded or, or and, and or are led by female entrepreneurs. So I think it's uh, I, obviously the statistic I'm sure is right, broadly speaking. Um, you know, in our experience, we've, you know, certainly, you know, if, if we weren't excited to, to fund, you know, all different kinds of entrepreneurs, I think we would be, have a hard time finding 
partner. So I, uh, I, I think, I don't know, it's been part of, it hasn't been a thesis for us to, to do this, but certainly we're proud to have a diverse uh, set of entrepreneurs that we're supporting. Yeah, from our perspective, I'm afraid we, we, we don't uh, yet. We've got a portfolio of eight uh, investments so far and not, and it's funny you ask, uh, or it has been asked because it's actually a discussion with a, with, with uh, our team internally. It's something we uh, ha have seen and need to address. Uh, yeah, so um, this is a topic that's been pretty close to my heart. I used to run a research, uh, a research program out of Emory University. One of the things we focused on was gender, um, big wide data sets of entrepreneurs and uh, gender. One of the things that came out of that work was looking at how um, female-led ventures that had a male co-founder tended to do much better than all female teams. So to game the system, I mean, the advice I've given to female pitchers in the past, they shouldn't have to do this by any means, but statistically it seems to work better, is to bring, if you're a female CEO, bring any male of your uh, person in your team into the pitch room with you and just have them sit there. It, it seems ridiculous, but somehow this tends to shift the, uh, the, the, the success rates in the room. Um, the second thing I'd say is there are lots of really exciting uh, female-focused female, -focused female uh, funds that have sprung up over the last five years. So in light of COVID, this could put you in a different market for funding than the general public. And at, in these really tough times, we're going to compete where we'll have the most success. So that might be a, an angle to take in, um, in trying to raise money for your business during this period. There's a, there are a few more questions we didn't get to, uh, a few more that I had to ask as well. But I want to hand it back to Annie. Uh, to give us, sort of take us out of this webinar. Uh, it's been been a, a great hour, so thank you guys. And back to you, Anne. Thank you, Nina. Um, and thank you, panelists. Uh, really interesting insights. And the audience, uh, attendees, a lot of great questions. Um, and we really appreciate the engagement across the board because uh, it helps provide us uh, the need to get back to you and answer all of these, so, so thank you for that. Um, once again, uh, Richard, um, thank you. Tom, thank you, Sean and Dan. I know this is a lot of time out of your day, but uh, being able to contribute to uh, this community is very, very much valued. So we appreciate that. Um, we hope the audience, you've learned a little bit about um, how funding startups in the current market is going, maybe some of the tips and uh, tricks that you can use, but also really uh, the engaged discussion that actually they may, this may catalyze uh, to do something different and uh, ensure success, uh, whether you're the investor or the investee. Um, so the engagement was wonderful. And then just to let you know, in two weeks, we will be back with our, another webinar. Um, stay tuned, we will be posting that on all of our channels, whether it's our Food Bite website at foodbiteworld.com um, or um, any of our uh, channels on Instagram, um, uh, Facebook, or uh, Twitter. Uh, so stay tuned. It will be really focusing on leading through change. Uh, a lot of what we've heard today is about leading through change, uh, pivoting what we're doing um, and addressing the current crisis, but with the envision that this might be a longer term shift that uh, will change all our models. So with that, I close today's webinar. I thank you all and we look forward to speaking to you again in a couple of weeks about leading through change.